the majority of psychiatric disorder involves dysregulation of emotion. So in other words, not really responding emotionally in the most appropriate ways. And this is a reflection of emotional style. And emotional style reflects how vulnerable someone will be to mental illness. Now this comes from a solid foundation in patterns of brain activity discovered by Dr. Richie Davidson. Now Richie graduated Harvard in 1976 and as a neuroscientist he's been studying for 30 years the circuits in the brain responsible for emotion and also how to be able to rewire circuits in the brain in order to cultivate resilience and well-being. And so throughout all of his studies, he's found that there's basically six dimensions of emotional style, and we're going to go over them right now. So first is resilience. So we'll just imagine that this is a spectrum. So one extreme is here, one of the other extremes on the other side. So when someone is slow to recover, so this is when the slightest setback tips them into another acute episode of panic or anxiety, then that's quite pathological. And so what Richie has noticed is that people that are resilient, they have strong activation of the left prefrontal cortex in response to setback and strong connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So in other words, people that bounce back, their wiring in their brain is different from people who are slow to recover. All right, so next one is outlook. So on one side, we have the negative. So when your outlook style is so negative that the absence of joy in your life makes you seriously consider ending it all, well, that's when a negative outlook has become pathological. An excessively negative outlook can also sap motivation. It can wreck your social life as well as your work life. Because assuming that nothing good will come of anything, you risk giving up on love or work or life before even really giving it a solid go. On the flip side, if outlook style is on the positive too much, then you might be at risk for bipolar disorder or variants of mania marked by inappropriate positive emotion. An excessively positive outlook often means being unable to delay gratification. An excessively positive outlook has difficulty sizing up situations realistically and uh, their excessive optimism causes them to make unwise decisions. As a result, they're unable to resist immediate temptations in order to achieve a more distant goal. They also don't learn the lesson because errors and consequences are nothing to worry about. Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow will be better. So that's an example of having a pathologically positive outlook in life as far as a emotional dimension goes. Another is social intuition. When your social intuition style is so puzzled that you have difficulty understanding basic social interactions and cannot form relationships, then it's become pathological and may even fall along the autism spectrum. And then on the other side, you have overly socially intuitive. And this is marked by being easily distracted um, by social cues and may be quick to form friendships and relationships. Next is self-awareness. So when your self-awareness style is so self-opaque that you're unable to perceive when your stress level begins skyrocketing, then you may not have any clue as to what steps to take to reduce stress or when illness is approaching. But on the flip side, a person can be so excessively self-aware that they become flooded by sensations from their body, like perhaps putting on a, a sweater that's a little bit too itchy or the lighting is a little bit too bright and so on and so forth, and then they become prone to panic attacks. Next dimension of emotional style is sensitivity to context. So when your sensitivity to context is so tuned out from your surroundings that you mistake the siren of an ambulance um, for perhaps a reminder that it's something that happened in the battlefield, you know, that's when it's something that's pathological and can turn into post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the flip side of that would be too tuned in, so much so that you can lose your sense of your own genuine self, almost like you um, are altering your behavior to fit in to whatever social context um, that you're in. And last one is attention. So when your attention style is so unfocused that you can't complete simple tasks or learn what you need to in order to succeed 
academically or professionally, well, then that's become pathological and can indicate full-blown attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But on the flip side, you could be so focused that you miss something or someone that requires your attention, like perhaps someone that's studying and doing their notes, uh, but they miss out on the fact that, uh, you know, their friends are, are over or, you know, not really paying attention to the clues that their relationships might be falling to the wayside because they're, you know, a little bit too focused on their work uh, or, or hobbies or whatever. All right, so these are the six dimensions of emotional style. And the bonus of it is, is that in Richie's book, you can actually have yourself fill out a questionnaire to find out where you rank on all of these dimensions. And of course, the brain can rewire itself in response to experience. So if you wanted to have more resilience, that would require having greater connections and greater activity in the prefrontal cortex, right? The prefrontal cortex is in charge of executive functioning and long-term planning, uh, decision-making. And so the more activity you have there, then the more it can suppress activity inside of the amygdala. And so people who are resilient, they have a lot of connections and activity between the, the PFC and the amygdala. So one of the ways to be able to strengthen this connection is to actually use some of the uh, mindfulness meditation that Richie mentions in his book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, and I highly recommend it. And so these are the six dimensions of emotional style. Bye for now. 